right. We are now live. I just got the email, the buzz on my phone telling me that I had an email saying that we're live. Hello, Stellarium. Gotta mute my YouTube video again. Oh, did you hear an echo? I heard my own voice. Yeah. Ah. All right, welcome everybody. Go ahead and let's get the chat going. Hi, Kyle. Oh, you can barely hear us. Which one of us, or both of us? Alex Hello, is here. Alex. Hey, Alex. Usual crew. Hello, John. Hey, thank you for joining again, John. Good evening, Anne. All right, in case anybody didn't already notice, we have Kate running the chat for us. So feel free to throw in questions at any point and Kate will get around to them. If not, she will bug us. And no when our... I think I'll just have to speak up uh, or move the mic a little closer then. When our guest uh, comes on today, please throw questions in the chat. Yes. We at, want a lot of questions. At the end of the presentation, she will be, we will be taking questions, so you can ask uh, whatever you want about this incredible topic. Ah, uh, Alex, uh, our topic for tonight is Kuiper's lunar legacy. So we'll be talking a lot about the moon and also the uh, things going on at Yerkes that had to do with things like mapping of the moon. And it's going to feature a very special guest today, uh, Lynn Zielinski. <laughs> right. I'll 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 try, Alex. I'll, I'll try not to move. <laughs> hey, Jeff. Welcome in. All right. 
let's go ahead and let's jump right in as Lynn will be joining us in about 13 minutes. So that'll give us a little bit of time to discuss the moon and the phases of the moon and uh, some other little interesting aspects. All right. So welcome into another episode of The Classroom. Uh, for anybody new, I'm Adam McCulloch. I'm the Planetarium Specialist here at Glass Education. And with me as always is my co-host and professional astronomer who recently got her degree from the University of Chicago, Katia Gosman. And we are gonna be talking a little bit about the moon and then we are gonna have a special guest join us, Lynn Zielinski, who is an award-winning teacher who has spent now a decade researching this subject about Gerard Kuiper and the evolution of lunar observing uh, in the mid 20th century. So there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about. There's a connection to Yerkes and uh, just a really cool time period for science in the United States. So we're gonna dive all into that in about in a little over 10 minutes. But for now, we wanna talk a little bit about the moon because it's a very common question that we get when we're at star parties. So people always want to know, A, what phase is the moon in? And how do the phases work? So we're gonna dive in and we're gonna take uh, different perspectives of looking at the moon and show you exactly why we get those phases and how they happen. So first and foremost, if the sky is currently set to this evening, so if you were to go outside tonight, uh, assuming, assuming you're here near uh, Williams Bay, as you can see, we have Yerkes set for our location here in Stellarium. So as long as you're somewhere in Wisconsin, you can go outside this evening and find the moon nice and high in a crescent phase. Another nice thing about Stellarium is you can actually go in and take a bit closer of a look. Now, unfortunately, the sun is a little bit in our way. So let's just fix that. So here we have a uh, waxing crescent, which means that we kind of have that crescent shape of the moon that we all recognize so well. But it is currently, with each uh, ongoing day, more and more of the moon will be illuminated, making it a waxing crescent. So we're getting closer and closer to full every single day. And when we go through the other phases, you'll see why there's a difference. Uh, one other thing, I always like to refer to the waxing crescent, especially when it's an early waxing crescent, and it's a very thin strip, as the DreamWorks moon, because you kind of picture the little DreamWorks fisherman sitting on the end of the moon with his fishing pole out. Uh, so that's just kind of something I like to refer to that phase as. Uh, now, normally, Kati and I uh, don't really like the moon. Uh, we definitely like looking at things that are a little farther off into the distance. Katya, do you want to talk a little bit about why the moon is not always an astronomer's best friend? Sure. Yeah. So don't get me wrong. If I want to observe the moon and that's my primary target for the evening, it's fantastic. Um, the moon is actually super cool and has a lot of interesting geological features on its surface. Unfortunately, when the moon is out and it's a full moon or getting close to full, it's very bright. And so it'll uh, block off a, lo a lot of the objects that we want to observe. Uh, and so if we want to observe, for example, kind of faint nebulae um, or like further away clusters, that makes it kind of difficult. It'll wash out everything that we want to see. And so the best nights to go observing is actually during new moon when there's no moon at all, because uh, then the sky is at its darkest. Uh, if you do want to observe the moon, though, I would recommend going out when the moon is in a, a quarter, so like a half moon, either the first or third quarter, uh, because then you get enough of it that there's cool features to look at, but it's also not blinding you. <laughs> I've looked at the full moon, even through like a normal Dubsonian sized telescope out on the lawn. It's very blinding if you try to look at it, especially without a moon filter. Um, so definitely try to look at it when it's crescent or at a quarter. Yeah, so uh, while we don't always like looking uh, at the moon today, that's what we're going to focus on. 
And for all those of you who are not sure, uh, the phases of the moon have to do with where the moon is in its orbit relative to the Earth and the sun. Because when you're looking up at the moonlight, all you're really seeing is reflected sunlight. So I thought it would be interesting if we actually looked at the Earth and the moon from the sun. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to make the moon a little bit bigger because it's more fun to see it when it's a bit larger of a size. Now we're going to make it probably about 10 times its real size. So when you see that it looks bigger than Earth, just know that's, that's my doing, not the actual size of the moon. <laughs> and it even says here how much it is magnified. So from right now, you can just see Earth as this nice pale little blue dot, and you can see the moon here. And if we start to play time forward, and we go a little bit faster, you start to see that the moon appears to be turning. And you can also see that there, you don't see any shadow. So you have to keep in mind that right now we are in the middle of the sun, looking out at the moon and Earth. And so now we're going very fast. We're already in July. So now we've completed just now one complete orbit of the moon. And we haven't seen any shadow. We don't see any of the phases. Because from the sun's perspective, you only see the side that the sunlight is reaching and reflecting back off of. So from here, it doesn't look like there are any phases of the moon. However, if we stop time, go back to right now, and we'll have to zoom out a little bit. Now we go to Earth take the ground and the atmosphere off. And we zoom in a little bit on the moon. What we can do from here is just open our date and time window. And we can just step forward day by day. One second. Nope, we need location window. Uh, Alex has an interesting comment uh, in the chat. He <laughs> says that in his high school astronomy class, one month was about equivalent to one moon. <laughs> Which is actually pretty correct. Um, the moon does go through it's like cycle of phases every like 29 and a half ish days uh, as seen from Earth. And so this is pretty close actually to the definition of what we call a month. Yes. And right now what's happening is we did not go to the center of the Earth, which is what I needed us to do. So now I'm just trying to figure out what it is. Uh, anyway, I think what we'll have to do is just go back to Earth and have to do this the brute force way. Even though, of course, this was working earlier. Did you do the control G? I did. Hmm. I don't know why it didn't work. But not a problem. We'll just zoom out. And with the moon up nice and bright, we can focus on it. And we'll just step forward day by day. And it will just kind of slowly start to move through the sky. And as you can see, here we will take the land and sky off. It starts to rise at the beginning of the night later and later. And as we get closer and closer to full, you can see that right at sunset is when you have the full moon. And that is because that full moon is when the moon is on the opposite side from the earth as the sun. And that's how you get the full moon because uh, the one entire side of the moon that uh, is reflecting sunlight is also facing us. 
Now, um, however, the moon doesn't actually change its physical face that's facing us as the moon is slowly turning in its orbit as it goes around the Earth. And one way to show this is if you go and change your location, you can actually change from Earth to Earth. Oh, nope. That, I don't know. Oh, that's probably Jupiter's, one of Jupiter's moons. So we go here, figure out where the Earth is. We can then zoom in. And once we get the moon to be a little bit larger again, we can step through day by day. And you can see here we're back almost a month from now where the moon, the entire lit side of the moon is facing the sun and the entire uh, shadowed side where there's no light from the sun hitting it is facing us. And that's how we get a, f a new moon. And so here we have a new moon. And then with each progressive day, you get a little bit more of a crescent, and that's called a waxing a crescent. And then you get where the shadow is perpendicular to us, and that's how you get first quarter. And then when most of the moon is illuminated, but it's not quite full, it's in the gibbous phase. And because with each day we're getting closer and closer to full, we get uh, what's called a waxing gibbous. And then of course you get where we get the full moon, and as you keep going around, now it's starting to kind of turn away the other side. So we get uh, a waning gibbous. So it's going to get smaller and smaller until we get down to third quarter. And then you come down to a waning crescent all the way back until you have a new moon. And those are the phases. And that's how uh, the phases of the moon are completely dependent upon where we are and how we're viewing them. Now it's already 814, so we are going to welcome on our guest. So as soon as we get her in here, we are going to uh, uh, welcome our guest in and switch over. Oh. One moment. Okay. Stop. All right. I'm actually already out into the main room. Okay. So it's going to have kind of a funny little view down there. <laughs> All right. There's two of us in here. And once Katya joins, we will be set. All right. Here? Yes, ready. So uh, welcome, Lynn. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, I'm Lynn Zielinski. And I'm a retired physics, space science, and astronomy teacher from Glenbrook North High School. And I've been teaching there for over 30 years. And I've been playing around with Yerkes for about another 20 years. And all of the wonderful folks over there. Um, right now, I'm currently the vice president of education and outreach at the National Space Society, which is an organization that wants to settle on the moon, among other places in the solar system. So I'm really excited to be here tonight. And like me to start? Yeah, let's just jump right in. Yep. 
Sorry about that. Okay, now we should be good. Okay, <laughs> so um, I'm here to tell you a little bit of story tonight. Um, it's about an artifact that we have at your story. Um, many, many, many years ago, about 20 years ago or more, when I started coming to your I noticed that there was this artifact. And whenever we asked people about what the artifact was, we were told only a couple of things. We were told that this artifact um, from around the 19th and um, you can see that it's made of wood. Um, it's a white flow with uh, hemisphere at the top that's white. The bottom is wood. It's twist. Um, as well. And you can see that it tilts um, side to side. And what's going on here? Um, anyway, the uh, <laughs> globe tilts from side to side. And um, we also know that the globe um, was uh, part of work that Gerard Kuiper did on an atlas that was um, very prominent um, in part of the landing humans on the moon and mapping and naming the moon. And so, we knew that Gerard Kuiper had used this particular artifact to um, create one of the moon atlases, the project that he did. So Gerard Kuiper, Peter Kuiper, Gerard Peter Kuiper, um, the story kind of starts with him. Uh, it starts that he was the director of the observatory um, and McDonald Observatory. Um, in 1947 to 1949, then he was the rector of the observatory a second time from about 1957 to 1950. And the story that I want to tell about this particular artifact is that time period of 1957 to um, In 1960, he left the observatory and he founded the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory out in Tucson, Arizona. And he took many people that were working at, working at the time that were working on this particular Atlas project of his um, with him. And so really the visionary that did some amazing thoughts about the moon. So I wanna just kind of tell you the story and step back in time a little bit about the moon 19. And in the 1950s, only thing we knew about the moon was what we could see through telescopes and taking photographs. We could only see one side of the moon. We could um, only get pictures of the moon. Its resolution was as good as the telescope that was being used. And fortunately, Yerkes 40 inch telescope produced some of the best photographs of the moon of that day. And so those images were key, along with images from telescopes in other places uh, around the world, including the McDonald telescope, to create this atlas that he was. So he was a visionary. And there were things that he knew that we didn't know about the moon. He knew that and there was lots of discussion about how the moon was structured and what the various features of the moon were and how they were created and developed. If you look at this image here, you can see two 
is a section of the moon where you have this nice big crater here in the middle, you have a bump in the middle of that, where did that come from? And then down here, there's another little crater. This might actually be a volcanic caldera, um, or caldera, I'm sorry, caldera. And it might be part of this range of mountains that are just going back and forth over here. And then we have this crack, kind of like a, a canyon of some sort, going through this smooth area. But then what's all this rough stuff over here? All of this rain that's kind of rough um, and mountainous and stuff like that. How do these features kind of fit together? You know, were, were these features created by volcanism? Were they created by impact craters? Were there plate tectonics involved? And even when you looked at the edges of the moon, you could see that there looked like there was a range of mountains here coming out over here. And this is actually kind of interesting. Part of the story that I'm going to tell you about how the moon was mapped in the And um, it, it also is interesting because scientists at the time were asking questions like, is the moon solid? Is it dusty? Is there lots of um, of dust sitting on the surface of the moon. Um, how come there are more craters on the moon than there are on Earth? But why are all these things happening? Um, or how did they even happen? And that those were the things that we didn't know and Kuiper didn't know. So as a visionary, he um, had this idea of creating a lunar mapping project. And in this project, um, he, knew that obviously there were no spacecraft at the time and the only kinds of images that you could get were from, from telescopes like Gergi's telescope. And so he wanted to create three atlases um, from these photographic images. And so he started this project at Gergi's observatory in about 1950. Five, somewhere in that time frame. And he had also gone to uh, IAU conference, International Astronomical Union Con conference um, in I Dublin, Ireland. And he met a couple of people. The key person that he met is over here on the right. His name is Ewan Whitaker. And he had put out a uh, flyer at this conference asking for anybody who would be interested in working on this lunar mapping project. And the reason this is significant is because at that time, uh, the moon was not anything very interesting to most astronomers and astrophysicists. Uh, what was interesting was all this new stuff being discovered called galaxies and um, these Galaxies were like not within our galaxy. They had spectra and all these stars had spectra and there was all these other things. Everybody was looking out at the distance further and further away. Nobody was really looking at the solar system and the planets and especially the moon, even though it was sitting right there in front of their face. So he was looking at more detail um, of the planets and the moon and our solar system. And everybody else was kind of looking out in space farther and farther and deeper and deeper. And that's what makes it special. So Ewan Whitaker was the only person at that particular conference who took up Piper's flyer and said, you know what? I think this might be interesting. And so he picked up the gauntlet and contacted Piper. And Piper invited him over to the United States to come work at Yerkes Laboratory as a photographer and working on images of the moon. Ewan Whitaker knew a man by the name of David or otherwise known as Di, Di Arthur. And he was an expert in not only um, surveying uh, lands, landscapes and that sort of thing, but he was also a very good mathematician. So you have Ewan who's really kind of a generalist and you have Arthur who's really kind of a, a specialist theoretician and mathematician. These people 
Bryn Whitaker brought and asked for David Arthur to come to the US and work at your feet with him. And they stayed with this program in Gerard Kuiper for the entire duration plus and migrated to the United States afterwards. Really kind of a cool story. And so um, Kuiper's uh, vision included the atlases and they were all started at Yerkes Observatory in about 1955 to about 1957. Um, the first atlas was called the Photographic Atlas, I'm sorry, the Photographic Lunar Atlas. And it was completed in 1960, which was time um, when Kuiper moved all of his moon folks to the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. And so this was the only atlas that was started and completed at Yerkes other two atlases that were in his project were the orthonographic lunar atlas. And the orthonographic atlas is uh, taking photographs from the photographic atlas, the first atlas, and putting latitude and longitude lines on them. And this is where Kuiper started to partner with the USGS, um, the Geological Survey of the United States geological survey to kind of start mapping the moon and naming its features and doing it in a formal way. And that atlas was almost finished when Yerkes, um, when they left Yerkes, but it took an, an extra year to get it completely finished. So in 1961, it was. And then the last atlas um, came by a little bit later because it was a little more difficult to do, and it was called the Rectified Lunar Atlas. It was completed in 1963. But, and I'll talk about what rectification is and what rectified means, but, but basically you have an image of the moon and you look at it from the side, like if you could stand 90 degrees from your image and look at the surface, you would get an astronaut's eye view of the moon and its features. And this was very important, complete study of the moon. Now, why is that? Well, you have to go back and look at history here. So let's go back in time for a few minutes and let's look at the age um, of space. When did it first start happening? I remember 1955 to 1957 was when these atlases were started. The first launch of a spacecraft, the dawn of the space age, occurred in 1957, late October. So Kuiper, as a visionary, had already started looking at the moon and had started talking to the Air Force, US Air Force, about funding um, his lunar mapping project. And he had done this and gotten some basic funds for it. And then when the space age launched, um, and we start with Sputnik, and you can see the history here going all the way down to about 1959, towards the bottom here. Um, and in 1959, if you look right over here where my cursor is going across here, there's a spacecraft called Luna 3. And that spacecraft launched in October of 1959. It was a Soviet spacecraft. And it was a spacecraft that produced the first images of the far side of the moon. And so Kuiper had already started his lunar mapping project in 1955. Now 1959, the Air Force is getting interested. They're starting to get a lot of funding. And remember, up until 1959, there were no pictures of the backside or the sides of the moon. No pictures or images of those. Only kinds of images we saw, um, this is a picture of um, Luna 3. Um, kind of looks like a Sputnik in a, in a lot of ways. Um, but the only images that we could see of the moon were basically from our telescope. So here's a Luna 3 image on the left. And it's uh, not in all that good a shape, actually. It was uh, not have very good resolution. It um, 
very, very grainy. You can see that there are a lot more craters on it than the uh, near side of the moon. And then on the right-hand side is a typical picture from the photographic lunar atlas. And you could see how much better and how much closer you could see on the moon from the telescope viewpoint. So you can see why the Air Force was interested in getting really good images and, and mapping the, the moon. Because think about it, now the space ages occurred and one of the first things that the Air Force wanted to do was send people to the moon and make an outpost and live and defend the United States from the moon. That was actually part of the plan and actually part of the original program um, when it was started. And so it was very exciting that happened. And remember, we still hadn't even sent the human into, into the space yet at this time, 1969. So we're really moving forward. And uh, what did the moon actually um, tell us? I mean, when, when we look at the moon from this perspective and like, what is what can we learn from the moon? If I'm an Air Force guy and I want to map the moon and I want to land spacecraft here and that sort of thing, um, where do I go? Well, the only thing that we know is about this much of the moon. From the photographic lunar atlas, you can really only see straight on this much of the moon. These edges here are all kind of distorted. Um, because the moon is a sphere. And so uh, this was kind of important to figure out what it looked like on the edges and the sides of the moon. Because if you're going to land somebody there, you're going to want to have an accurate moon map. You're going to want to have uh, the ability to identify features. You're going to look at something and know whether it's a crater or a volcano or a Maria system or Know, some other kind of thing. And what he wanted to do is wanted to see what we can't see. And that was why this third atlas, the rectified lunar atlas was created. It was created because he wanted to see what we couldn't see because we couldn't see half of the moon. Okay, we couldn't really understand those features in any really good way. So, um, the, the atlases were um, also important because they proved to be invaluable in the other programs um, that were launched, Surveyor, Apollo. Um, these, these programs landed spacecraft on the moon. And so the Air Force was interested, the US government was interested, and you know, Kuiper's pro little project here became a big deal because, again, didn't have any good detailed pictures of the moon except for Mars. And so these atlases were real important in making um, decisions about where you're going to land Surveyor, where you're going to land Apollo. And they were also important with the Ranger program. The Ranger program was where they actually first started to map the moon using spacecraft in a meticulous way. So this image right here is of Ewan Whitaker and um, Gerard Kuiper um, working on, on one of these projects. So what is rectification? I told you I was going to explain it, so here it is. Rectification is being able to take the features on the moon. So we have features like this, object right here, looks like it could be a crater or a caldera or something. And notice that all of these are kind of distorted. They're kind of oblong or oblique. And what rectification does is it's an astronaut's eye view. So it's like moving to the side of the moon over here, looking at the side of the moon and saying, hey, that's not really an oval, that's a circle. And so rectification means the ability to move to the side that 
this object as how it really appears from an astronaut's point of view. How did you get rectification? Well, that process started all the way back in 1931. And the key player here for the first idea of rectification came from a gentleman by the name of Frederick Wright. And Wright um, did something very interesting. And Piper happened to visit and work with Wright at one point in his career and found out about this thing, this globe that was being created by Wright. Here's images of this globe. It's actually a glass globe. Um, and you can put a light inside of it. Um, so you can see it's on pretty crude, it's on a piece of wood, and it's got some basic wiring out here. And uh, there's a light that goes inside. And what he did is he took this glass globe and he painted photographic motion on the outside of it. And then he took a flat image of the moon, full moon, that had been taken on a plate and projected that image onto the photographic emulsion on the globe and then exposed it. After that, he developed it and lo and behold, you've got a spherical moon or at least part of the spherical moon that you could only see about half of it. And it gave you that bird's eye view of features on the side of the moon. So you could see some of these craters and, and other objects. And that was really neat. Unfortunately, there were only about 10 of these globes made. One was given to Kuiper, had it on his desk at the observatory for all of his years that, that he was at the, the director of the observatory. And he used it to kind of help him figure out how to make the rectified lunar atlas. And the resolution of this globe wasn't all very good. Um, it was just one way to do it. But Kuiper had thought, well, you know what? Maybe there's a better way. And so created the Kuiper hemisphere. So this globe um, is wooden. It's on top is white. Bottom is left as a kind of a holder. And the, the whole wooden globe um, is actually very large. You can stand next to it. I don't have a picture of it here, but it's, it's quite large. It's about, I want to say, or in diameter, something like that. And um, the globe was a prototype after doing some research. I discovered that this was not the actual globe that was used to create the rectified atlas, but it was a prototype globe to do that. And um, it was abandoned and left at Yerkes in 1960 when Piper moved to the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. And he was seeking, instead of a wooden globe, of creating a globe that was um, better at producing images. One of the problems with the globe that even though it was painted white, you lines of the wood that had been put together to make the surface. And so if you have an image of the moon and you have lines in it that are kind of flowing through, even though it was well sanded, well polished, and well painted, you could still see some of those lines. It wasn't good enough for his photographic atlas. So instead, when he had moved to the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, metal hemisphere was used. And that one was the one that was actually used to check the images on and uh, create the, the rectified lunar atlas. This, the images here show that they had about a 30 degree tilt um, from various sides. And no one really knows why um, this base was created or how it was used. Um, Ewan Whitaker, when I spoke to him a number of years ago, he said that the base was never there when he was there. Um, and so in 1960, he'd never seen this base. Uh, he'd only seen 
top half of it, which could be removed and placed vertically so that the images could be projected onto it. And I'll show you a diagram of that in a little bit. Um, so you have basically this hemisphere that is vertically held up. Um, and then down here, you have the oh, setup where you have some lenses, you have a light bulb, um, incandescent light bulb that shines light into some plate and uh, glass plate, which is where the moon image would be. And that's all ends up being projected onto this hemisphere. Um, and they actually used the hallway um, because they needed about 15 or more in order to put this whole apparatus together and to be able to um, create uh, the images that they wanted. And then um, they could take a camera over here on the side and look at the image at the edges of the moon here because being a curved moon and this being a curved globe, the image that was being projected curved around it, straightened out the image and lo and behold, get a flat image of the moon. And to create a lot more of pictures of the moon than the, just that small percentage of the moon. Here's another view of, of what's happening. Um, they would take the camera and you could take and you could take straight on images, after not ID. Here, move along this arc. Nice and straight on. So you can do the tops, the bottoms, the sides of the moon. So it was really, really cool to be able to. Here's an image of the actual. Uh, globe, hemisphere, um, the metal one that was used at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. The gentleman in this picture was, was a graduate student at the time. His name was um, William Hartman or Bill Hartman. And uh, Bill Hartman, you may know him as uh, one of the uh, hypothesizers of the impact, the large impact theory of the creation of the Earth have a Mars-sized object coming and hitting the Earth and throwing out material to create the moon. He's one of the scientists um, that created that hypothesis. Um, you'll notice that the moon is on a stand. Um, here's an interesting story about the stand. Um, when I was talking to uh, Dale Cruikshank, who was also a graduate student, at the time worked at Yerkes Observatory and worked on this project, he said that they used to call this the Chandra Sakar stand. And I said, why would they do that? And they said, well, Chandra Sakar was uh, an astronomer at the observatory and uh, he, uh, his name actually moon bearer. And so they were joking with them and calling the stand the moon bearer or the moon holder because it held up the moon for this project. And so that's why they, they called it the Chandra Sakar. This stand was never found at Yerke. Um, it must have been taken to the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Um, when I was down there, they haven't been able to find it. We did find the globe um, or the metal globe. It was in a crate hadn't been opened in like 50 years, maybe not that long, but a long, long time. And um, so it was really cool to open that up and take a look at this. And um, I think they might have the Chandra Sakar stand somewhere, but um, not sure it hasn't been found yet. But we also found when we went to the Lunar and Planetary Institute for all of the missing plates um, from the plate archive at Yerke that were associated with the moon. And those plates had been taken by Kuiper to work on this moon project. So he took the plates with him and there was a whole library of them it has since been returned to your thanks to um, myself and Ozzy, um, Queen Osborne at the observatory. So um, a rectified lunar atlas. And uh, here's an image of 
um, some of the pages in it, notice that you can see these are rectified images. They're taken at different views. Um, they're taken with different lighting systems, like when it's at first quarter or when it's at full moon or when it's at third quarter or a different crescent peak. So they could get different lighting and you can see the features better in some ways than in, in other ways. Um, and so the whole atlas is, is full of these uh, images from the limb of the moon. And some of the discoveries that happened because of this rectification process, um, Hartman actually discovered the Mari Oriental, which is Maria region right here, this big Maria region. You'll notice that it's kind of um, like a bullseye pattern. And that bullseye pattern are ranges of mountains that have been created from some giant impact that occurred on the moon. <clears throat> and if you think of water splashing an ocean field or um, something impacting water, you get those waves coming out of it. And these are those kinds of waves. Those waves are these mountain features right here under the moon across here. That, this is Mari Oriental. This is the best photograph you can get from um, just a straight on image of the moon because it doesn't vibrate over, doesn't, the moon doesn't twist over enough for you to see a face on image like this. So this was a huge discovery, um, one of the most beautiful features. And because of this, we now know that this is a mountain range um, that was created and how it was created because of this process. Um, and so this is one of the, the cool discoveries. There's another image of Mari Oriental, um, one taken from an asteroid, an, an astronaut point of view on the left, and one taken from an Earth-based telescope view on the right. You can see the difference in how the features look. The feature on the left, left is rectified, the feature on the right is rectified. And so um, other discoveries, well, in the process of looking at all of these features, one of the cool things that came from it is that Whitaker and Arthur got to name on the moon. And 58 of them actually, new craters and new they went to the International Astronomical Union and got created on behalf of the rectification process. And uh, that, that was another set of discoveries that, that occurred. So that's my little story about this particular artifact at the observatory. And I think it's a really cool story and I hope that everyone enjoys it. All right. So if you wanna stop sharing your screen, I can switch the view back. There we go. There we are. All right. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna kick things off right now. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, so it never occurred to me that it was only uh, uh, over, like what 70 years ago we had no idea what the other side of the moon looked like. When you were researching, did you come across any theories about what they expected to see? They expected to see it exactly like they saw the front side, the first side. Um, they were expecting to see lots of Maria, some cratering. What was unexpected was that the whole backside just almost all entirely cratered. And so that kind of changed some of their theories about how the moon was created. Um, I'm sure it was part of what Bill Harpin was looking at because what would cause all of those big Maria regions on the near side and not on the far side? Something had to happen. And what was it? And um, after the astronauts had gone to the moon, they noticed that the crust on the near side of the moon was thinner than the crust on the far side of the moon, part of its development. Why was that? Maybe the lava that flowed from the mantle region of the moon flowed outward um, or, or vigor on the near side from the impacts. 
um, because it was a thinner crust so they could fill up areas more and maybe that couldn't happen far side. So yeah, there were theories, lots of them. And the uh, Soviets were real hot on that trail. They, they claimed, you know, they found the far side of the moon first. So they named, and you'll see that they named most of the features on the far side of the moon, <laughs> Russian, Russian name. Interesting. And that actually tied into the next question uh, I was thinking about asking you about. Uh, so when you discover 68 new features on the moon, do, do they have a system that they went by to name those things? Yes, they did, actually. Um, and it's a real interesting story. When I was talking to Ewan, uh, it all goes way back in the history where they were doing hand drawings of the moon and its features. And there was lots of um, issues with um, keeping the names, proper names, um, the same from feature to feature, crater to crater. And turns out that in some of the reorganizations of the various astronomers who are doing all of these different drawings, they had um, sections of the moon that were geocentric, um, Earth-based, Names, um, astronomers, um, and other parts of the moon, bigger features were labeled for heliocentric, sun centered gravitations of astronomers. So, like something like Copernicus is a big feature and it's from a geocentrist, where some of the smaller features are clustered in an area where there are smaller craters. Um, and so it, it kind of started a whole methodology of how you name the, um, the moon. Um, and it's a real interesting story and, and I could probably pull up some diagrams and show you what the different pieces are, but um, not, not here, but it's a real interesting story of how that happened. That's awesome. Can I ask a question? Of course. Sure. Yeah, so I was wondering, you were talking about how they painted the the sphere with like emulsion or like photographically sensitive emulsion and exposed it how how do you even go about like doing the exposure for that because like in a regular dark room right if you have you know a plate for example you expose it and then you dip it in all your chemicals to you know make it set and all of that and you go through like four different trays how do you do that with one something that is like not flat <laughs> and something yeah, use, that's like a big 3D shape. You use like and then big... how do they get the, because they have to somehow line up all the different sections, right? When they're doing the projection. So how no. does that work? No, so you have a globe and you paint the emulsion on the outside of the globe, all over the outside of the globe. Okay, mm -hmm. then you take a plate of the image of the moon um, that's already been taken of the moon, to reverse it so you make a contact plate of the opposite, okay, mm -hmm. so that it's a real picture, it's not a negative, okay. Mm -hmm. Then you shine the light and the projection of that image goes around the whole moon. So it's one image, <gasps> one plate, okay. Okay. Then you gotcha. take that falsified, exposed, image, so you do your exposure time on it, okay? Then you take that and when you go into the dark room with it, you have like a bucket of container with all the emulsions and stuff in it, and you do it mm -hmm. the whole globe at once, dip the whole thing at one gotcha. time. Oh, so there was one- So how do you oh, dip it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> how do you dip the globe in without like, because you can't like touch the different sides or else you're gonna touch the so, emulsion. So the globe, um, think of a light bulb, like a globe on top and then there's like a stem, mm -hmm. a glass stem. Oh, there's a stem. little holder down here. Okay. And so you could dip it in without actually touching that. Correct. <laughs> Got it. Uh, so earlier really cool. on, there was a question about uh, when was the last time like the lunar surface changed? So I guess, do we know the last time the moon was hit? Like what the newest craters are? Sure, um, probably a day ago. 
moon's constantly being bombarded by by objects, meteorites, um, asteroid pieces, uh, all sorts of things. The moon is is constantly being hit, and so we do know that there are new features, um, especially from uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter um, and, and other recent spacecraft. You know, they do these these maps of the moon. And they're constantly being compared with maps from previous missions of the moon. And they can see that some of these features don't change. And they're very small. You don't see giant changes in the moon. There have been some observations within the last 10, 20 years um, from people who are observing the moon that they might see something like a flash of dust maybe or something like that. There have been documented cases of that. And then they go in that area and they look to see if they can impact crater or what has changed. But the moon's constantly changing. I actually, years ago, about, I want to say 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, um, took pictures of the moon with the telescope um, and uh, Kyle Petworth and I actually did that with some students and did it with the purpose of taking those images and comparing them against images from the early photographs taken at the observatory. And what we wanted to do was see if there are any large feature changes that we could tell. And we were not fortunate to be able to, and I had kids working on it for a couple of years. Um, it's very meticulous, it's very detailed, it's very hard to, because there's so many features, mm -hmm. but we were unsuccessful in finding anything big. Gotcha. So if you're looking for like a new crater or seeing how the surface has changed, do you do you do like what they did back then using a blink comparator and you'll take two images and kind of blink back and forth them to see if you see a change? Do you like overlay them? Well, I, I think it's sort of like a blink technology because you are, and overlaying would certainly be a, a good way to do it. I'm not sure how scientists today do it. I, I really don't. Um, mm -hmm. But those seem like logical explanations and possibilities for how to make that happen. I see we also have a question in the chat um, from Sean. Has anyone ever been able to view an actual impact or film it? Are the impacts logged somewhere? Not to my knowledge. Um, people who are more into it probably know the answer to that, but I don't know of any. I haven't heard of any. Mm -hmm. just, just from Earth observation, really. Right. Uh, so I have one last question. Oh, wait, no, that's not necessarily true. You know, they did take um, one of the orbiters and they did purposefully impact it into the moon. Um, and they were photographing it at the time, I do believe. Um, so yeah, probably. I don't think a natural object, but I think a man-made mm -hmm. object they've done. Well, awesome. That would be something to look up. Now, I have one last question. Unless, Katya, do you have any others? All right. I'll, I'll ask afterwards. <laughs> okay. Um, so you said how there were three atlases, and the third one was when they finally did like the rectified images. Um, when was the next kind of big update to that? Was there another survey with a different telescope? Yeah. So there were actually there was actually a fourth atlas, just created at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, using um, some of those images. Um, Plus others, uh, Kuiper scoured the world actually for the best images of the moon that he could find. And a fourth atlas was created, a fourth lunar atlas, and it is far more detailed and um, finer resolutions. And that at these atlases, these four atlases, when you put them together, are still today the most. Um, the best atlases that were ever created using Earth-based telescopes of the moon. 
And the only images that are better than these images are ones done from spacecraft um, but, and atlases that have been created from those. Um, but these atlases are still state of the art for the Earth, for space telescopes. And that's just cool. They've stood the last test of time. And they were significant in the whole Apollo, Apollo program. Right. I mean, what a great way to just show how uh, dedicated they were and how great they did, how great of a job they did. Absolutely. All right. I think that wraps it up for all of our questions. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Lynn. It was a pleasure to hear you talk about this subject. Uh, and I am happy to have known a lot more about something that I had seen in your keys, but had never really put that much thought into what that odd egg-shaped thing was. <laughs> well, thank you. It was my pleasure to do it. I'm really passionate about this project. And I'm excited to be able to share it with the world. That's awesome. Well, thank you, everybody else, for joining us. And this was another episode. So hopefully we'll see you guys all next week. Have a good night, everyone.